The Siberian tiger is a formidable predator that can grow to be over 500 pounds and up to 3 meters or 10 feet in length from nose to tail. It boasts sharp canine teeth that are over 3 inches long and can tear apart entire limbs in a single bite. Known for its vengeful and begrudging attitude towards anyone that dares cross its path, the Siberian tiger has a cunning mind and can remember encounters for weeks. The Amur tiger, also known as the Siberian tiger, was once a near-extinct species, but through conservation efforts, it has repopulated the province of Primoria near the world's largest undammed river, the Amur River. For decades, the tiger sat comfortably at the top of the food chain, feeding on moose, elk, and wild boar, but humans started populating the region trying to scrape out a living in the dense tiger forests after the fall of the Soviet Union. Poachers realized the potential of this area and despite settling among some of the most dangerous predators in the world, they hunted the Siberian tiger for its meat, which fetched good money in the black markets near the Chinese border. For many, like Markov, this was their only sustenance in the broken post-Soviet economy. One cold winter morning in 1997, Markov set out with his friend on a 50-mile drive deep into the heart of the frozen taiga forest. The plan was to spend the night in a remote cabin and leave to hunt in the morning. As the sun dawned, Markov set out on foot, accompanied by his attack dogs, who could also be used to sniff out the scent of the Siberian tigers from their footprints. In below freezing temperatures, the snow covered the solid ground by at least 10 inches as Markov limped his way through the layers of snow among the forest trees and thick brush. Markov stumbled upon a set of footprints that were much larger than his own hands. The tracks were undoubtedly from a great Siberian tiger, and he followed them for miles, hoping to catch a glimpse of the elusive animal. He carried a shotgun and was confident that he could easily take down the tiger for a profitable kill. Finally, he saw the tiger in person. It was feeding on a wild boar, and Markov locked eyes with the fierce animal for a brief moment before it returned to its meal, unfazed by his presence. Markov knew he was close enough to take the shot he needed. So he fired his gun at the tiger's torso, convinced that it would soon succumb to the fatal injury. He followed the injured tiger for a few more miles as it limped away in the deep snow, leaving a clear blood trail. But eventually, the trail disappeared, and Markov was left alone in the snowy wilderness, uncertain if the tiger was dead or alive. Realizing that the tiger must not have been fatally wounded, Markov decided to return to his camp and come back the next day. Before leaving, he stored some of the wild boar meat just outside his camp and went to town to trade the rest. However, while Markov was away, the wounded tiger had followed his scent to the cabin and reclaimed its kill, destroying the wellhead in the process. The tiger then camped outside the cabin, waiting for Markov's return. When Markov returned, he noticed his dogs barking loudly and incessantly, warning him that something was wrong. He peered through the window and saw the tiger in the distance, waiting for him. Markov quickly called his dogs back into the cabin, realizing that if the tiger had not left after reclaiming its kill, it must be after more than just the wild boar. Markov realized that the animal had come for revenge, and he couldn't afford to let it live once it had smelled his scent. He set up his gun through the shooting port in the wall and opened fire, wounding the tiger twice. Despite being shot several times, the tiger disappeared into the forest, still able to carry itself. Markov decided to go to his friend Dunge's cabin not far away and drive away to safety with him in his car. However, his friend urged him to stay the night at his place because the car's radiator fluid had to be drained every night to keep it running, and they couldn't leave right away. Markov was visibly frustrated and decided to make his way back to his cabin and deal with the problem the only way a poacher knows, by shooting the tiger until it's dead. Little did he know that in his absence, the tiger had torn down his cabin's front door and had made its way inside, chewing and clawing at anything that had Markov sent on it.
it shredded to pieces clothing, mattresses, and tools that he had used, and then found a well-hidden spot outside the trail to lie and wait for Markov's return. It was dark, and Markov was just making his way to the entrance of the cabin when he was ambushed by the tiger. Caught unarmed, he soon found himself at the mercy of the vengeful Siberian tiger, and after their last two encounters, there wasn't much mercy left. Several hours later, investigators discovered a chilling scene outside the camp, one that captured the grueling nature of the attack and the terrified helplessness of Markov in his final moments before being devoured. The snow around the scene had melted and flattened from the wrestling and wriggling that Markov must have tried while being eaten alive. There wasn't much left of Markov's body anyway, just a few bones here, a pool of blood-red snow there. Some of his clothes were found several feet away, his shoes still carried his severed feet, and his sleeve still held his detached arms. The tiger was momentarily pacified after tearing apart its hunter and headed downstream. Word had now gotten out about the man-eating Siberian tiger, and terrified poachers and settlers evacuated the tiger forest to escape the same fate as Markov. The only one still in the area was 25-year-old Andrei Pachutnya, a trapper who had set up traps in the forest to catch animals for their fur. Andrei's parents urged him not to leave the house to check his traps until the tiger had been found, but he did not heed any advice to stay inside and set out into the forest. Andre's parents urged him not to leave the house to check his traps until the tiger had been found, but he did not heed any advice to stay inside and set out into the forest. In Andre's absence, the tiger had found his cabin and thrashed it, just like it did to Markov's cabin. The Siberian tiger seemed to want to follow and tear to pieces anything that smelled remotely human. Upon his return, Andre was ambushed by the tiger near a neighbor's cabin, nestled behind a mattress as if it had been lying and waiting for him all along. There was not much fight or resistance. Andre tried to pull his shotgun from his shoulder and take aim, but the bullet refused to fire in the harsh Russian winters. Older guns were known to have ammunition failures from frozen cartridges, and his shotgun failed at the last moment he would have wanted it to. Andre was now easy pickings for the Siberian tiger as it jumped on top of him, leaving him little chance for a fight. When young Andre's father called for a search and rescue mission to find his son, they did, but all that was now left of Andre was a few bloodied clothes and a charred piece of the cross. When young Andre's father called for a search and rescue mission to find his son, they did, but all that was now left of Andre was a few bloodied clothes and a charred piece of the cross. The tiger had been feeding on him for over three days when the search team discovered him, and there was little of Andre they could salvage from the site to return to his father. At the time, Project Tiger was a Western-funded animal conservation group operating in the tiger forest, trying to stop illegal hunters and poachers from driving the Siberian tiger to the brink of extinction.